It is the Anfield Rap. It's Neil Atkinson. You're all the way up there if you're watching on YouTube. My God, hello. Uh, I'm going to look at these, though, mostly through the show. These, in this instance, are Phil Blundell, Ian Ryan and Adam Melia uh, to work through basically what's happening in the world of Liverpool transfers and so on and so forth. Alexis McAllister is in and now we treat him as though we've had him for many a year and barely discuss him again because we move on with the other targets. That's the way in which this works. On this show, we're going to have a clip from our gutter show. Uh, this week, the gutter show, well, on Monday, the gutter show that Rob Gutman hosts, discuss Pavel. Colwell and Van der Ven uh, in terms of centre-backs or as he's now affectionately known as the Anfield rap Mickey Longlegs in midfield it discussed uh, it discussed Taram, Vega uh, Gravenberg, Kone and Lavia uh, the talks around Taram do seem the most advanced there was a bit of chat that they were happy with the attack but there was a massive Chiesa shout uh, Federico Chiesa from Juventus that came out of nowhere at the weekend that I know excited Phil Blundell for one uh, because you think he's great I love him I think he's absolutely fantastic I think the, the only problem with him is how that he had a couple of bad injuries, so you know that's that's right in our that's right up our, our street, that isn't it? Yeah, we need bad the rotation injury, strategy get him in. for the yeah, bad we injury, the, get him in. A physio rotation <laughs> strategy. <laughs> you know, the, the physios have got a bit of time on their hands now, so you know, we've got we can get them something to do. Um yeah, he is indeed mildly exciting. But these links are gonna come up as we go through this show. What I wanna do though is almost talk about the idea that if money and almost in fact no, I'm gonna start here. Adam, at the weekend, the thing that I really did not want to have happen in the world of football happened. And I almost feel a little bit like, well, it's out the way now. Yeah. Uh, at some point, they were going to win that Champions League. The, the, part of this conversation is influenced by this. We know what we've got to go up against next season uh, domestically. Um, a couple of seasons ago, we nearly won the quadruple. City won the treble. But Manuel Akanji and Taki Minamino, to use two names, aren't getting in any World eleven. So when we have this chat, I'm going to come on to sort of this idea of 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 how this of how this needs to work but they have had not really the same limitations around money how they've done it is different it's a conversation you know i don't think that they they haven't just splashed the cash but they've known they live in a risk free environment all of that said they've won the european cup they've won the treble i almost don't care about the treble i care about them in the european cup and i'm i'm gutted that they have it was going to happen at some point and in a way it almost feels like now it's happened it wasn't as bad as i thought it might be yeah, I, I, I'm sort of, I suppose, maybe the same as you in that I'm surprised at how little I, how, how little I was bothered by it. Um, I'm glad they didn't win five 0 or something like that. Um, uh, yeah, the the it, it, it is it, it's frustrating really because I think they've um, they've been able to to save a lot of energy the last few weeks, um, <coughs> and that's the only thing that's the only t- pl- place that I can possibly cram Liverpool into sort of it's been a terrible season for Liverpool really you know in, in terms of what's happened to us what's happened to the clubs we dislike and all that sort of thing so the only way I can cram Liverpool into it into the story the narrative even is to say that I think that in the seasons where we specifically have made them go harder they've uh, struggled in in other competitions particularly the Champions League because they've needed to um, they've needed to use all their energy mental and physical for for the league, um, and and that wasn't wasn't really the case this year. I think they've been really good, to be fair. Um, and, I, and I was thinking it on on Saturday. I do think this is probably uh, they, there was a time during the season when everyone was saying, "God, well, this is the, they, they, they've they've dipped, haven't they? This is the season we should have uh, what a missed opportunity." And I don't, I didn't think that was true at the time. I still don't really think it's true now. I think they've got lots of different places they can win matches from. Um, and I don't know. I don't like Guardiola's football anyway, in general. His normal football, I didn't like his Bayern Munich team. I liked Messi and his Barcelona team. I just think it's a bit... At its, you know, when he, when he perfects it, I think it gets a bit boring. So having the Haaland element maybe makes it a bit, a bit more chaotic and interesting. So it's been a terrible season for, um, for us. And um, yes, I suppose to go back to what you were saying around... Um, around uh, peripheral players um, there's, there's, there's an interesting point there I guess because that's, that's where City have, have, have done well with, with some of their peripheral players I would say it's the area which we possibly have been impacted the most this season this season just gone compared to the season before you mentioned Minamino uh, we also had a, a good contribution from Oxley chamberlain in that season and Cater uh, you know, had an underratedly large amount of appearances and fairly good performances, you know, up to the, almost the very end of the season. Um, this season, absolutely not. So, you know, it, may, it, it, it is that sort of thing, I think, that which, um, which, which gets forgotten sort of when it goes well and when it doesn't. So that, that's the last two seasons. One season it went well with our, with our peripheral players and one season it didn't. And I, and I do think that sort of thing really can make a difference with your, 
uh, I guess not just the, the, in, in some some of the games where where you where you're struggling, you just need something, you're scratching around. But I guess sort of like you know when we talked, well, I've listened to a few of the reviews of the season that you've done. They've been really good. People have talked about um, em, emotions dipping quite quickly. We've been felt fragile. I think that's the sort of thing where you kind of need somebody. You maybe need you need a, a senior player, a senior pro, someone who's who's done it, but also feels fresh, not completely exhausted from the previous season to have, to have picked them up. And, and and we and we just didn't have we we were we were scratching around for leadership or something or I don't know what from everywhere and the lack of players on the periphery. Somebody like a Minamino, it's not his personality at all, but he would pop up and just score goals in the League Cup. I remember him scoring a brace somewhere in the League Cup in the early rounds of the season we won it. And, and I think at that point we weren't particularly up, but it just it just gets the club up. You've, you've won a game, you maybe hadn't won the last one in the league, and you just won a game just because a lad who's good, he's got quality, comes on and scores two against Norwich or someone, and then that's it, and then and then you're up again until the, 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 the next league game, and maybe that one starts well and you score. So it's that you know that, that I think that it is it is vitally important to get those peripheral players, which is going to be interesting to see who they are next season and how it works. The, yeah. the, this is my thing, Ian. If money and almost reality in inverted commas were no object, I want to talk about what we think he'd want from the squad, and then we can sort of impose that back on the the, the players that are linked with. So I'm talking about the profile of the players, how many we think that there needs to be, how many per position, what are the age range that you'd want, what's the type levels of physicality, and what do we think the approach is going to be? For me. I think it is a good point around the dynamic of a squad. You know, what do we think that is? Where do we think we've gone wrong? How do we think we need that to work for us next season? Yeah, I think in terms of numbers, it can sometimes be difficult to put an exact number on it. I mean, people used to always talk about you'd want two players for every position, but, you know, there are footballers who are more flexible than others, for instance, and therefore they can cover a multitude of issues if you've got them. I think if you think about the midfield, for instance, people would often say, and I've heard this said on, on different shows, where you, you'd maybe say things like, well, Liverpool have got eight already. Can they have a ninth? And if so, where are they going to get the minutes from? And my thing was, you might need the extra one because of the makeup of the squad. And that was always a challenge for us, that we had a lot of those players within that eight or nine where history and data would tell you they were going to miss a lot of football because you knew Chamberlain in a normal season would miss games. You knew Keita probably would as well. You knew Thiago would. And that's where you come back to. You're probably going to need more than you think because of the makeup of those players. But if you add, and we just added McAllister, for instance, who looks like an extremely robust footballer, doesn't miss many. You could talk about Mohamed Salah in, in a similar vein in terms of the forward line. There are certain players, and you can't account for every scenario, but there are certain players who you know they're probably going to play but somewhere between 35 and 38 league games for you. And I think Liverpool now need to have an eye on robustness. So yes, quality is really, really important, but it's nothing without availability. It just isn't. You need to have lads who more often than not are going to be available. And don't get me wrong, there is the odd thing that can happen where some divvy will come out of his goal and almost end someone's career. And that you can't account for. But broadly speaking, you want lads who you know pretty much unless something really mad happens, are going to be there or thereabouts for you every single week. And I think that's where Liverpool have maybe let themselves down. I think that's where the planning comes into it or lack of planning, where they've gone into these campaigns and these seasons with lads who you just know you can't rely on. And I think that's where my frustration's been at times. And I think that's something the manager now will have an eye on. I'm sure, you know, in terms of the um, the medical departments, it'll be across their radar as well. Liverpool simply have to have more robust footballers in that squad. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that I think a lot of the the stuff that led to the decisions that led us to those points. I think last summer, particularly, I think there was a bit of a gamble from the manager, and it was like, right, we'll we'll go again. And they obviously they got pre season wrong. I think the the ultimately they make a bad decision about what the state of the squad looked like. I think if you just said if you go back a year and say, what do you think uh, Naby Keita and Oxley Chamberlain are doing next season? They'd have played far more football than. And Fabinho. Actually. And Fabinho as well. Fabinho, like, they'd have played more football and Fabinho would have played football at a higher level. And I think it, when we talk about planning, I think you can you can only plan for so much because you don't know what's, what's going to happen. And there's, Listen, the, the summer before, it's the same thing and it works for all intents and purposes because we got, ourselves, we got ourselves into a position where it just worked and you get a bit lucky with cup draws. Like last season, we 
probably don't get lucky with cup draws either, do we? For example, like, like we play Brighton in the fourth round. That's that's a hard tie. You play Manchester City in the fourth round of the League Cup again. It's not the, it might even be the third. Round, we had a tricky it? Champions Hopefully League group, but the knockouts absolutely we've never seen. Absolutely. We've never had easier knockout rounds. Have absolutely, we? and it, it's sort of a marriage of circumstance almost that leads you into this position. So it's I, I find the idea of planning for X quite difficult because it's most of the stuff in football is there's there's so much blind luck involved almost that it makes it really hard to plan for and you can only go all you can do as a manager and a football club is sit there on the first day of the season and go well not necessarily the first day of the season but the first day when the transfer window is closed and go right are we ready are we happy with what we've got and that's what the Liverpool I suppose they're planning on this summer like last summer I think they probably were which we can all sit here now and say wrong terrible decision but I think they would probably still say they were happy with what they had. Like, you know, Klopp sitting down with you and going, well, no, I'm I'm fine with these lads. I don't think that was sort of a diversionary tactic or anything. I think, I think it was something he genuinely believed. But sometimes these things just don't work. And also sometimes you do these things and you end up with, you know, things coming out of it that you don't expect. Like, if we had signed a midfielder, we probably wouldn't know that Bacetic was what he is now. So there's various things. It might not have been that we use Trent in the same way that we have done. So maybe some good will come out of this, what was effectively, retros- well, in with hindsight, probably poor planning. But we'll see what happens, I suppose. But I think on that, Phil, as well, I mean, there's also there's also the thing of, so you, you can look at the players and say, well, what is the history record in terms of injuries like? And I think Liverpool had a lot that had the checkered history, which always made me concerned. But there's also the, how much have we ran them over the last four or five years, which... I'm not sure that was factored into the thinking enough as much as it should have been or could have been maybe because you'd ask these lads to go again and go again and go again and I think that's where you almost see one or two of them, certainly in the midfield area. You know, Fabinho gets mentioned, Henderson maybe as well, although you know, age was catching up with them as well where they just fall off a little bit of a cliff. For me, it's about risk and where your kind of pinch point is and where are you comfortable in terms of that risk. So if Liverpool went into a season, if the season was starting tomorrow and the centre-back options were what they are now, it's red flags all over the show for me. It would be red flags all over the show because you know, and you can get lucky sometimes and you can also be unlucky, but if you were going into a season tomorrow and Liverpool had Van Dijk, Canati, Matip and Gomez as the four, I know there's one or two others on the periphery, but if they were your four, you'd be thinking, I'm not happy with that. I'm, I'm uncomfortable with that element of risk because I know that three out of those four, I've got a really patchy record with injuries. And Van Dijk had the one against Everton, but you know you can't legislate for some of that because that is just out of the blue. But in Gomez, Matip, and Canate's case, you know they miss football matches. So my 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 risk or my comfortableness around that risk is very is very so, low in terms of I'm not happy with it because you can almost see what's coming around the corner so my question then becomes and again almost, very high I should say in terms of risk no but my, my my question then becomes and let's you know let's let's project this forward ultimately then so for instance you're saying to the manager now this is what you need to do as far as I'm concerned I'm Ian Ryan this is what you need to do what what does the ideal squad look like now for you in terms of centre-back options in the context of, and we haven't had the chat about it yet, but also in the context of what looks like a shift of approach from Liverpool, and we can work out whether or not we think it's going to continue. What does the ad? What does you know? And don't even worry. You know, I don't even. I don't, you can you can name any player in the world you want. <laughs> you want to name a player, you name a player. My point here is more: what does the what does the ideal look like for you? Think for Jurgen Klopp, and then stri- as we, as we now approach it, and then strip back, and we'll work out where reality is. So I think it's. Obviously, they'll have more information than those. This is what becomes difficult. So we can sit around here. We can say, well, you should do this. You should do that. They'll have much more data. And that's where, you know, Phil's probably alluding to, you know, they'll, 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 they'll base some of this off off data and science. And we can only base off what we've seen. But, you know, we, we know certain footballers miss games because we've literally seen them not being available. So I think in terms of Liverpool centre-backs now, um, they have to do at least one. They have to. They just have to do at least one. And then maybe they're doing someone who can maybe play a little bit of centre-back and cover in other areas. But they have to do at least one. You could make a case for two. And this is where the planning bit comes in because you can only do so much in one summer. And that's where the frustration is because you look across certain parts of the pitch and you think... I could make a case for them doing something there, you know. But you can only do so much now. And that's where you've, they've left themselves okay. a little bit in a position where you probably can't cover every eventuality. And we know that anyway, you can't always cover everything. But I think Liverpool probably won't do more than one. But I think you could make a case for them doing two. So on that then, I mean, the next question becomes, and you said one who can do a little something a little bit different. Do you think the approach is here to stay that we saw the last eight, nine games? 
I think it will be, yeah. I think it will be. I think if you if you suddenly see how it transforms Trent in terms of him enjoying his football again, I think it will be quite the shift to suddenly say, lad, we're not doing that anymore. And I know sometimes it's horses for courses, but I think you got loads of good stuff out of Trent. And yes, there will be some weaknesses there and teams can figure some of this out because they'll have the data and they'll have seen how it's played out and they can expose Liverpool potentially in certain games and they'll have to be conscious of that. But... If you want to get the best out of Trent Alexander-Arnold, I think having him in that position or at least the ability to move him in and have that hybrid role, I think it's it's massively important that Liverpool look to continue it. Do you think they're going to stick with the same approach? So, to a point, yes. I think there's a couple of interesting things that happened this weekend that have put a bit of doubt in my mind in terms of transfer links. Um, the Pavard one is really interesting, I think, because I've, I, I've when I've seen him, he doesn't... I think his best position for me would be the right side of a back three. But that's obviously not really what we play. He's a fullback who can play a bit of centre back, but he's sort of neither of the two things. There was also Calvin Ramsey linked with a move to Preston, which sort of made me think that there's going to be a lot of Pavard right back if if this is a th- if this is a thing. And these are obviously only transfer rumours, and we've got to sort of piece them together and come up with opinions and, and positions on what we think that. That sort of makes me think that there's a world where Pavard is playing right back in a lot of games, and you're not buying a French international from Bayern Munich to be second fiddle for who's 27 large, exactly for large portions of the season. You're buying him because you think he's going to play football. So where's he going to play football? That's probably right back. But well, haven't you just described when you say a right back who could do a bit of centre half or a centre half who could play on the right hand side of a three? Isn't in practical terms a fair bit of that which Canate has been doing? Not to the same extent. I think he's been a centre back a proper centre-back who was used as mobility to fill in at right-back. I don't think Pavard is centre-back enough for it. I don't. I just don't, okay. just don't think that's what he is. But what that sort of says to me is that maybe there's more of Trent as a proper midfielder. And that's why I thought it was interesting that the, the Ramsey thing as well, because it sort of makes it look like, well, we want a right-back who can play right-back, but you're probably not experienced enough or good enough so they've got to get him out on loan to learn football whereas originally I possibly would have thought that he'd have just come in for like maybe a Europa League game here and there and League Cup games and you know 20 minutes left of a, of a Premier League game but if you're basically sending him out you're saying that that role in the squad almost doesn't exist to the same extent so you might get Trent doing a bit of that and then Trent in the midfield and then obviously games when he just doesn't play anyway so I Is there a Gomez line here Phil? I'm yeah, I think there will be. I think you, you can yeah, you can use him as a right back as well. I think he's probably a bit better at right back than people think if you play an orthodox right back and if you are playing an orthodox right back you can put Trent in midfield in a way that I didn't think was going to happen. If you'd have asked me 2 weeks ago, I would have said that the shape that we finished the season with was what we were going to do and now I'm just not quite as sure when I look at when I look at the transfer links and piece everything together. Do you think we're going to stick with the same approach? <clears throat> um <sighs> I, I think that I'm sitting on the fence a little bit because I think that on the one hand, Klopp's been trying to move Trent for a, for a good while, I think. You know, that if, you, if you think about um, Leicester away season before last, the game we lose, I, I, I spent that whole game saying, what, what, what's Trent doing up there? You know, why, why he's in, what, what's he doing in, in the channels there? He's in the way. First home game, I think, of last season, uh, I think it was that one, Palace, sort of looking at my seat at him, Salah and Elliot getting in each other's way and thinking, what's Trent doing there? So I think <clears throat> there's definitely been an attempt, an unsuccessful attempt <clears throat> to move him and, and this this then was a successful attempt. I I, I sort of, so, so on that hand, I think that, that, that it, could, it could be and I think it will be at some point during the season, we will see it again. I think that that, um, last nine games, eight of the nine were perfect fixtures to, to workshop things. And I kept saying the word workshop on these shows because I, I wanted us to be doing exactly what we did, work something out, look like we were playing, look like we were enjoying ourselves and, and working out how we were going to bounce into next season. There's just a bit of that doubt in my mind about the fact that it hasn't really had a stress test. And, you know, either just teams getting a bit of data on it and kind of working out how to how to stop Trent and then maybe you stop Liverpool or, you know, we're, we're, we're at Old Trafford and it suddenly, it, it, it's, un, it's under extreme kind of, you know, emotional stress and it crumbles and then, and then you know, the, 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 the team struggle to kind of um, 
get 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 back to their to, to to believing in it as much because they can suddenly see these huge holes which there are you know which everybody can see but you know we haven't sort of worked no no one's sort of worked out how to uh, how to exploit them yet so um <clears throat> yeah as i say I'm, I'm sort of sitting on the fence i do think we will see I, I do think we will see it in some form, but it's also interesting how seasons start. You know, if you think about the the, the players that we were sort of seeing at the start of, of of this season, in fact, every season under Klopp, I feel like we start and we think, well, that's what it is for this season. At the end, at the end of the season, by the middle of the season, at the end of the season, it's completely different. So, um, I th- I think that is more of a thing going to be more of a thing this season yeah. because the we've got two lads are going to be away at the under twenty one Euros. If we sign no one, we're linked mm. heavily with about four lads who are at the under 21 euros maybe even more than that looking at looking at the list of midfields we've been linked with so that's sort of me I, I think that basically a lot of the first portion of the season is going to be there's going to be a lot on Henderson there's going to be a lot on Fabinho there's going to be a lot on Thiago Bacetic and um, McAllister. McAllister whereas I think their, their role is going to be to get Liverpool into a position by Christmas that they can kick on I think and then you'll sort of see bits and pieces kick on more and it might be the point where Jordan Henderson barely plays after more than barely plays. I mean, barely starts a game of football sort of after February, but he'll come on for 20 minutes every game in a, a way similar to what Milner's been doing. And I think this is, there's a periodization thing that Alice Ferguson used to do where some footballers would play for the autumn. You bring Baber Toffin exactly, and then it'd be Carlos Tevez for a month. Well, you could say we saw that with Elliot and Jones. This, exactly, yes, one hundred percent. I think you might. I just think you'll see more of that on mm. the um, on the trend thing. Just in terms of the horses for courses thing, I think, and this is where recruitment plays into it, and it's really important because if you've got Canate, then you you're comfortable or you're more comfortable operating in that way because you know he's got the physical attributes mm. to be able to play centre half. And probably cover right back as well. And, and obviously, there will be times where maybe he gets a little bit exposed because there's not many centre halves who like getting dragged out wide. That is just, you know, that is that is fact. You know, all centre halves will say the same thing. They don't necessarily want to be out in those areas. But he has got the physical attributes to be able to get across and do it. If he wasn't available, for instance, and you don't sign anyone, then I'm not comfortable that it's it's a matter, but it's a Joe Gomez thing on a regular basis. Now they might be able to do it for one game. I'd have been more comfortable with the Joe Gomez of maybe two or three years ago being able to do it but the current incarnation doesn't to me suggest that he I don't can maybe think he's do that role anyway I don't think he him. is but I think in terms of recovery and, and speed over ground and stuff the old Joe Gomez maybe could have done that I'm not sure he could now to be honest listen he may get he may get better and he, and he may kind of you know find his form again but I've not seen loads of signs of that so again it's back to recruitment if Liverpool go and sign someone who's comfortable in that area maybe it's a timber and stuff but he isn't as physically imposing as, as a Canati for instance so then you've got maybe deficiencies elsewhere in terms of height and, and physicality so this is where the recruitment thing plays into all of this if you get some of that right it then allows you to do a little bit more but if Canati's missing for the first six games or missing at the start of the season like he was last year uh, or certainly the first home game doesn't play against Palace does he so that then he was missing the start maybe, of the season yeah, quite, that, quite that, markedly yeah he but was he isn't, he isn't, he is, like you were saying before he, you can predict he will miss games yeah and so, that, so then you are you are you are kind of you know you are then struggling to see how that then plays out if you haven't got a similar type to come in and cover Trent that's sort of what I was saying about the how the right back thing and how what you do with Trent differences because I don't think there's another sense but I don't think there's a realistically there probably isn't even a centre back we can sign who is able to do what Canate does in the same way because he's so strong he's so quick he reads the game so well he's just a very good he's a very good one-on-one defender and he's able to defend a lot of space like if you look at I remember Conte teams coming to Anfield and they'd be really hard to break down it's because the defenders are basically just defending a small amount of space he's the complete opposite of that in terms of what he's doing so if you take him out you can't I don't think I just don't think you can do the the false right back thing in the same way because you just haven't got a replacement and I don't see how it happens and that's why the, I found the Pavard link pretty interesting. So I think you could see Trent maybe moving into more into midfield as yeah. you've suggested but I don't think that would be an early part oh, no. of the campaign because you could also play right back. Yeah, because you've got to work right on it and yeah. stuff and listen, they'll be working on stuff over pre-season but obviously that's then another thing to try and weave in as well as the new players that you're bringing in as well and it almost feels like are they over complicating it a little bit possibly? As, as, if you're doing fantasy football or whatever, football manager, you can, I, th- I feel you, you, you're sort of thinking in your mind you could do horses for courses more than 
seems to happen in reality. So in my mind, I'm thinking I'm quite happy for Trent to play there against the bottom 10 or whatever. But I just think in, in reality, what tends to happen is that the season starts in a particular way and develops into its into its own thing. And then we will see hopefully a really good team by the end of the season instead of it being one week Trent's there and one week he's not. I just I just feel like that never really happens. Well, think, or, uh, maybe a Mourinho might try that, but I don't think that seems things to be Things evolve, don't thing. they? Like yeah, you think about it's more like that. Going back to Keita, for example. We signed Naby Keita in 2017. He doesn't play until the summer of 2018. Liverpool are a completely different team. When Naby Keita signs for Liverpool... Trent Alexander-Arnold has barely played the game and Andy Robertson isn't really a thing and we didn't know how good he was. So we signed a midfielder for a completely different thing and it's impo- it's sort of possible that things just almost accidentally evolve as well. And he got injured sitting on yeah, a plane. That's, well, exactly that. That's, that's, sure, yeah. <laughs> that, that's what I... <laughs> just like that, that's one of the things that I think happens to City this season. Uh, I don't think he starts the season thinking he's going to be playing four centre-backs or even five uh, when he takes the pitch by the end of it. I don't think he thinks that that's the case the Manchester City manager does evolve I think the horse of a course I think that was dead interesting because one of the things that I keep sort of coming back to when I've been working this, working through this stuff Adam is stuff like as is now currently on my screen that you can see and other people can't is Jadon Shaqiri's appearances for Liverpool in 2018 mm. where from nowhere he gets a mad run of games uh, in November that stretches all the way through until mid-December he then plays two of the games at Christmas uh, then comes back in again uh, plays against Brighton again then he plays against Leicester and then he doesn't start another game from the 1st of so the 30th of January having had a number number of appearances and starts from around the 22nd of September and this really odd you know that's a horses for courses thing that's this football that's going to help us get into this position but then he as I say he doesn't start another league game we obviously all know he starts at home against Barcelona but he doesn't start another league game there for an extended period of time my my I would end say that's this, more of an example of period periodization. I think it is an example of periodization as well. Than that's playing all of the bottom ten throughout the season. Exactly. No, I completely agree with that. They got him into a certain nick and wants yeah. to wants to run him whilst he had him there. And this is my. The more I think about it, I'm not saying I, I, for me it's not even about the links. The more I think, there will be more flexibility than we've maybe anticipated and maybe that we saw for the last ten, and that that could well influence things a little bit more and going back to Ian the idea of what does he want if money was no object I think we've a number of people not even necessarily including you three or even myself to a degree but I think that there's a general sort of sense that the way the managers always wanted to play every game is since he's been settled in the summer of 2017 let's say that it's 4-3-3 and it's going to work like this and these midfielders are going to do this and these forwards are going to do this and this is going to happen and he wants his full backs to do all this and I don't think I think if you asked him I think he'd want the options like I think if you said money's no object what does your squad look like you know reality is no object money's no object I think he'd want the options I think he'd probably want that we end up in a position February to May where it's a very similar approach to sprint for the line but I think he'd want the options before that point, before we settle on what we're sprinting for the line with. I think that's what you can see in his behaviour as Liverpool manager more than anything else. Yeah, I wouldn't disagree with that. I think, you know, which which manager doesn't want options? You know, which manager doesn't want? And I know sometimes they'll talk about having a slightly smaller squad, but they still want it filled with quality. They still want the best players they can get their hands on. So sometimes when it's been talked about, oh, does Klopp want, you know, an extra player? I think if you bring in a lad who... Or a different type of player, yeah, I think more yeah, importantly, yeah. a different type of player. Rather than the idea of numbers, yeah. for me, it's types. Exactly, I think yeah. he wants more types than he's currently perceived as wanting. Yeah, I, I think so. But I think it also is, he wants players of a certain profile and makeup because you want them to be available. You need to be able to count on these footballers more often than not to be able to go again. So I think the physicality thing is, is really interesting. And that's why I'm almost watching with interest to see how this plays out in terms of which midfielders they go for. And is it going to be... Someone like a Tarami with six foot four and imposing, and is he going to play kind of quite deep in a, in a sixes position, or would Liverpool use him in a slightly different way? And I think that's where it gets interesting with the likes of Manu Kone and Taram because I don't know whether it is one or the other because I think they are different footballers, but they can do some of the sim- some similar things. And I think that's where what Liverpool have been linked to is really intriguing because of the the very nature of them. You're not quite sure if they get some of these over the line. Where are they going to play them? And I think Liverpool have got a track record of doing this. You know, Phil alluded to it before, where sometimes you get linked with a certain player and you think he's going to come in and do this. But actually, Jürgen Klopp's got a different thing for him. He's got a different thought about what, how he's going to use him and when he's going to use him. And, you know, some of these footballers might not come in and they might not hit the ground running. And it might be a case of FFB now where they are going to get a little bit of leading time and it might be take them two or three months to settle in. So you've got to get that right as well. You know, have you got enough 
coverage already there to get you through those August, September, October months? You know, can you go with Henderson more than you think? I'm not too sure. I'd be a little bit concerned if I'm seeing Jordan Henderson in lots of starting lineups at the beginning of the campaign because I do think his powers are waning. So I think Liverpool have got to be thinking about that. You know, where's Harvey Elliott and all of this? I think that's. I'm not sure we've answered that question. You know, where does where does Harvey Elliott play? Um, and does he? Has he still got a role to play? I think he's a really talented football, but I'm still not quite sure where he, where he fits. And um, there's a the Carvalho question as well. He looks like he's almost certainly going to leave the club. Um, you know, where is McAllister going to play? Is he going to be more left hand side or is he going to be more right hand side? Some of these questions we just don't know. But I absolutely agree, Neil. I think the manager will want different options. He will want footballers who can do different things. And those footballers who you know you've described McAllister as a Swiss Army knife. They're worth the weight in gold. If you can put players in different areas and different positions and you can do different things for you to a very, very high level, then absolutely you want that as part of your squad. I think he's always been more open to flexibility than is ever really thought of. I think like there's a thing about him where he comes in and it's basically like, right, we're going 4-3-3 and it's going to be this. But if you think about it, in what is second summer, he signs Keita and Chamberlain effectively and Keita... No? I've got a Mr. Summer there. Yeah, sorry, he signs the book, but only Chamberlain comes in, doesn't yeah. he? Yeah, sorry. But, like, they are very different as footballers to what he was doing. And, and he doesn't, wants Kaiser doesn't work that out as well. Like, yeah, and, like, I, I've, I've got a long standing theory that he basically spent four years trying to replace Genie Wijnaldum, and for various reasons, it, it just didn't work. And one of the reasons was that he was very good. But one of the things, he, you know, Chamberlain is basically the more of a mainstay of the centre mid and the run to Kiev for example and it's a different style it wasn't it, it's a bit more explosive a bit different then Keita comes in he's a bit more technical as a footballer then eventually there's Thiago who's you know levels above everybody if we're being perfectly honest at what he's capable of but it was not the same even though Liverpool are basically playing the same way from 17 to 20 realistically his idea of what he wanted I just don't think it came to fruition it sort of goes back to talking about planning and how things happen at the start I, I, if you'd have said in 2017 to Klopp how do you envisage this team looking like in 2020 I don't think it would have looked like it did <laughs> you know it was one of the best teams on the planet for a long period but it, I don't think it was what he intended it to be but he made the best of what he had and got the best out of it because he sort of saw things in players and went right well, we can use that we can use that we can use that but I think he'd rather have more things to use as in he got one approach. I think he wants three. So that's probably what he's doing in these transfer links. I think you're seeing a number of different things, which is a sort of what he's always wanted but never managed to get into play, I don't think. So on the on the one approach, not what wanting more than one approach, I think there's certain bits of commonality between not just Klopp's successful side, but also uh, successful sides, but also, for instance, where Guardiola is now. And trying to imagine, you know, the, the sort of changes. So I think it's really interesting to me that, from the outside looking in, Phil, I feel like so there's a bit of I noticed there was some grumbling online yesterday around the way in which Guardiola uses Grealish, and the reason why is because he sort of took a lot of the fun of Grealish out of Grealish. Grealish gets it, looks after it, everyone comes up the pitch, holds it, moves it on. That to me is really similar to how Liverpool started to use Curtis Jones. Mm. You can make a bit of an argument it's actually how we used to use Manny at times in games as well. That Mane, whilst in our heads, he was always about to streak through and score or something like that. A lot of the time, Liverpool would work the ball into a position. Sadie would look after it for you for a minute, move it a little bit, and maybe just pop it back to Wijnaldum and then go from there. That idea of on that... The, the commonality in my head there is because they're all left-hand side, but the mm -hmm. idea of you get there, you drop anchor, the team moves up the pitch. So there's like this anchor attacker. I think you've got, you've got to see with these halfway defenders... Some teams are playing one, two, or changing it as game state sort of goes. That's something that I think we've done more of in the past and and, and really had two halfway defenders, if you know what I mean, in Robertson and, and Trent in the past. There's the idea of someone playing as a playmaker. There's the idea of someone who does odds and sods all game for you. I think City have Bernardo Silva, who's brilliant at it all the way through. I think Brighton with McAllister have had that this season. You got to see that. We've just bought McAllister. But even there, I think we've had a little bit of that in the past as well with players, even though it's not quite looked the same way. My point is, is ever football looks different, but it's often there's often loads and loads of commonality. My thing here, though, is that, again, if we're imagining that, I think we can get locked into maybe trying to think about positions a little bit. I think, he, I think he'll have definite roles in mind. I think he'll want, this is how we get up the pitch. He needs to. This is how know. we stay there. I, I, 
what Ian and then Phil said sort of made me makes me a bit nervous really because I think we are everybody's kind of naturally optimistic in the summer for a while anyway until it all sort of goes wrong and that and I feel like because it went so badly wrong last summer as Ian Ian was was saying which was kind of the culmination of a few poor windows really and and you know as I said, we we had a bad season, but it was it, it followed a, a the, you know the worst transfer window under Klopp, and and you know we can, everybody can kind of see that and could see it at the time actually. Um, I think we sort of um, like it, it. It's almost as if we're we're sort of playing the the, the, the transfer game a bit. At the club are playing it. It feels like one of them where there's a lot of. It, it feels a little bit scattergun, and and as you just said, Neil, which made, made me kind of interject. I, I just I just think we can't be we, like you know. There's there's a fire. Um, the, the 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 mood music and, and behind the scenes at the club's been poor for a year. Um, we we've we've got. I, I think I said it on on the gutter when I was on with Rob last week. You know, getting a fella in, whether you know whether he turns out to be brilliant or not, and you know I like the cut of his jib. At, you know, just before the window opens is the latest in a f- quite long line of backroom appointments and departures that just as a piece look poor they don't look like a really really well-run club so I think um following on from from a, a poor season I think we sort of never think about the the possibility that it might go badly again um so we really need to uh, it really does need to be addressed and I think we can't just sort of throw enough midfielders at the wall and see kind of how we do because I think we we, we do we do probably need to to start well. Um, obviously, I think starting well is the only way you can win this league. So that will be the plan, I'm sure, because you need to, you know, the, the, the thing that puts us under so much stress at the start of the season, I think, is that knowledge. But it's still true. Um, you know, the only way you kind of get past this City team is by killing their spirit, really. So um, I think that, that, that there is... There, there is there is a certain amount where where you know Phil's right. There will be kind of a bit more flexibility, uh, and 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 I think Neil's right. We 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 will have players that do more than than just one thing. We don't just have specialists. But I don't know. I just I'm just sort of being the prophet of doom. Okay. No, no, it's fine, fine, fine. <laughs> uh, listen, we'll do a clip from the guts. We're going to come back. Um, here's uh, Rob and the firm uh, talking about Pavard. With Pavard, it's like he's more less likely to get into the final third. He is going to be holding that station. So. It makes it more difficult if you're asking Trent to be in midfield, but you're still going to need him to get up and overlap on Salah because we're still going to need some way to stop people doubling up on Salah. The right side of our team is fascinating to me. I mean, this is a whole fascinating window for a lot of reasons, mm. but what we do or what our plans are, there are so many different options. Like, you can look at us and say we're going to buy a right back and then we're going to still do 4-3-3 and we're going to have a more defensive right-sided midfielder who's going to cover around with Trent stuff and you can see a world where that works but then you can see oh, okay well Trent's definitely going to be a midfielder and we're putting him straight into the midfield stocks and we're looking at new defenders that's also a possibility but then there's also the fact that Trent starts as a defender and moves into midfield and all three of those kind of require different characteristics so who we buy, the range of depth of quality and um, characteristics of these players might be quite wide, but we don't know which one we're going to go for yet. And until we kind of nail our flag to a mast, we won't really know. It is the Anfield app. You can support the Anfield app in a myriad of ways. Download the app. Uh, use the tokens if you want to have a little dip into things. Uh, subscribe through the app if you want to choose to do all of that. Uh, that is on there as the app. Also on uh, you can do it through the website as well. Uh, and if you're on YouTube, you can subscribe through the YouTube little bit at the bottom. Please consider doing so. Uh, it helps us uh, pull all this off on a regular basis, as you'd expect. Um, where this then turns into, for me, Ian, is him working out precisely, and maybe not even precisely, because as Phil says, I think that there will be... I think I, I think he wants to feel as though there's room to grow and change. And I also feel that now with the five subs, with the analysts, with the nature of the other managers in the league, I actually think he needs the variation. I think we need the variation. And I think we need to allow the room for the variation also the players for it. That's why for me, I'm not asking them to be, 
I'm not asking them to be multifunctional in terms of function. I'm almost asking them to be able to fulfil a couple of different roles over the course of 90 minutes. I think that's something that he'll be looking at. I'm not asking them to all be the best player on the planet, but I think there's games where you need the sort of footballer who can get you 20 yards up the pitch playing at the base of the defence, and you need the sort of footballer who can get you 20 yards up the pitch playing at the tip of the attack. You know, I think that that's what they're going to have to work on here. That's why I'm intrigued by the Chiesa shout, really intrigued by the Chiesa shout. It's why I think Taram is the next cab off the rank mm. because I feel as though they're looking at him thinking could do it up there but if you actually look at his profile he does a lot left hand side at centre mid yeah. and holds in mid last year which makes me think Liverpool are thinking we can use him Trent's doing the passing and the defending with him he's doing the defending but he can also do the carrying and we can look and we can push and we can go from there I I am beginning to think Taram's coming in and they're going to use him much more as a six than people think yeah it feels that way and I think I think as a manager, you do want the ability to to maybe change for certain games as well. You were talking about Grealish before there, Neil, and I've seen similar chatter about all of a sudden he's not quite the swashbuckling player he was at Aston Villa where he was going past man after man after man. You are seeing a different Drac Grealish now. Um, he's not as he's more selfless now. Uh, I mean, you see it when Liverpool play against Manchester City, and he's the one who's absolutely tracking back to intercept that ball. You never would have seen him do that for Aston Villa, and I know it kind of breaks down at a corner, but he, he just didn't get that same kind of output out of him. I mean, Ferguson was the master of it with Rooney. I mean, Rooney was supremely talented, but how often was he kind of almost the sacrificial lamb where he'd end up doing like a role where he's just dropping in and covering for like kind of full backs and stuff like that and doing a lot of the legwork for people like Ronaldo even though he was so gifted himself so I think managers do want that from footballers um, and I think you've seen it with, with, with Guardiola you know he's He's used someone like Akanji in a really kind of specialist way this year. He's also used Nathan Aki a lot more than maybe in previous years as well, where they've kind of maybe they've taken a little bit of time to adjust to something. And then when, when, the, when they've grabbed it and when they've understood it, he's then been willing to kind of give them a, a slightly different role. Where I'm intrigued with the Liverpool thing and the midfield chat is what do we want from our midfield? Do we want it to go back to what it used to look like in terms of maybe there's not that many goals in there, but they're all performing a certain kind of duty and role for the team that's facilitating what's in front of them? Or does he want to look at lads who can maybe chip in with, with eight to ten goals? And that's where, you know, you mentioned when he brings Chamberlain in, it's a little bit of a shift and all of a sudden you've got someone bursting from midfield and scoring goals from outside the box and scoring goals in big games. Does he want that? Or does he want to go back to, we're really, really solid, we're really compact in the middle of the park, we're physical, we can outrun you, we can outplay you, we're not going to get many goals from there though. The lads in front are going to get the goals. And I don't know whether we know what that shift looks like yet because it will all depend on who comes through the door. I think you know, I think there's Taram's, the links are hotting up on Taram whilst we're just sat here uh, and working through a couple of things. Supposedly he's meant to have gone to Nice and said he wants to go and therefore there's going to be, uh, he's pushing for a reduction in the fee to go to Liverpool, Phil. For me, Taram's interesting. I've long said, you know, when he scores the winner in the Champions League final, I think the best in his position in the world now by a mile is Rodri. I think he is the best one who plays that role. I think that early in the season when City were finding it a little bit hard first part of the season, he's the one who doesn't. He's the one who's still there for them and I think he makes a massive difference. What I mean by that is I think it's very... I can't imagine going and buying a player. We want to be better than City. I can't imagine going and buying a player. Literally, if you had all the money in the world, I don't know who I'd buy to say, I'll get him because he'll be able, he'll be the match of Rodri who's playing at City, which I think means you've got to try and do it differently. And that's where I am really interested in Taram and that Liverpool might have an eye on that. The idea of someone who can burst with the ball, haven't won it. You know, he's talked and he's done interviews where he's talked about being being into more more sort of defensive work. Someone who's prepared to be, not that Rodri isn't mobile, he's very mobile, but someone who's prepared to be perhaps even more mobile. The fact that this is this stuff's constantly evolving. And I feel as though Liverpool were at the front of that evolution for a period of time. And my biggest gripe about the, about the last 18 months is I feel as though we've stopped being at the forefront of evolutions and in fact dipped into at best the midfield of it. I'm really excited by Taram in that way, in that role. That's where I think we might have an eye on something here. We might have seen something in this football that makes us think he's going to be the best one in this position for the next five years. Yeah, I, you've got to also... Not starting tomorrow. No, 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 no. But you've got to credit Guardiola with creating this out of Rodri as well. When oh, you, absolutely. When you actually look back at it, if you Google Rodri, it's depressing how old he is. Oh, yeah. Like... I was, yeah, I, yeah, really the I was like, it must be 29 now. It's like when you sort of got to the point where you looked at De Bruyne and it's like, oh, hang on, he's getting on a bit here. That'll be all right. And then you go and look at Rodri and he's about 26. 
And that means he probably signed when he was, what, 21, 22, something like that. And he doesn't and he have a good first foot. 12 months. No, he doesn't. Because, but he's also, he's living in the shadow of Fernandinho and he's learning a lot from Fernandinho. He's excellent and he's gone. He's gone past him and he's better than him. He's got he's got everything and that might be that, you know, he's, he's big, he can use the ball well. He's, he's confident on the ball. He can move around the pitch, get into different we could, positions. We, we could uh, target Fernandinho, couldn't we? You we know, could, the, yeah. The, you, the, you, you, could. Can't, you can't, can't target Rodri. Rodri. He's just, you know, he's about six. He's what six inches taller than Fernandinho, is probably. He? Which is yeah. like that's just an advantage, a huge advantage for him because he's got the absolute lot. And you know, maybe they've gone. Well, we can turn him into him, but it won't happen overnight. So, what you do in the meantime? This is a sort of I take what you were saying before about the scattergun thing and I sort of think that almost might be how you stumble upon something if you try three things you might get one that works if you try one thing you might get one that doesn't work and it's it's a really tough balance and like as I said before I think there's a lot of stuff that Jurgen Klopp's done at Liverpool which wasn't necessarily his intention at the time but it worked so Choram you know Choram could come in and be a completely different type of footballer to what you intended to buy. He could be the type that you bought at the time. There's there's loads of unknowns. It's why I'm quite excited about things. There's just a lot of unknowns and I quite like unknowns in a weird way because I sort of think that we've got the right man to make unknowns knowns, if that makes if that yeah, makes sense. It, it is exciting and it's it's funny because it, you only get that if you if you have a dip, really. You know, the the, the great thing about Cot's first few seasons was you could see you could see the progress yeah, every exactly. year. It was quite sort of, you know, it was it was it was smooth progression but at the time I remember saying I don't even know what year this was it gets harder and harder and that's what you see you know that <clears throat> there's obviously <clears throat> external factors which I've you know grumbled about earlier on which which made, made it even <clears throat> even more difficult sort of changes in policy and changes of, of things and just messing things up but uh, uh, this is this is something which me and you've talked about Neil of you know the the does the po did that policy need to change where we said uh, instead of kind of looking at, at, um, at, at people's stats and maybe getting a you know the, the Robertson type Wijnaldum type Matip type as in that level of of signings you know did that need to kind of be replaced by the almost like we we are going to wait for the next Virgil van Dijk in every kind of position you know Thiago in every in every position we're not going to compromise. Um, so I think, with in a sense, you know, scattergun's a, a, a bit of a, a, an insulting way of looking at it. But you could say that 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 we are back there in a sense. But actually, whether we are or not, it is it feels right. It is it is exciting. I do I do prefer it to be honest. I, I, and I think that there is something in it. You've got to be more relaxed if you if you're Klopp, if you're a manager. You've got to accept that it's humans you're buying, and you not you, you can't be you can't just have one plan. I think on the. Um... The evolving piece as well. I was just thinking about kind of City and listen, we all know they're playing by their own rule book and stuff like that. But you see it kind of getting in towards the latter part of the season with Kyle Walker, where he almost just becomes this specialist in certain games where he doesn't start the Champions League final. But if you're playing up if you're playing against Real Madrid and Vinicius, Kyle Walker's starting because of the skill set he's got. And I think it's back to that flexible flexibility point Neil you know certain footballers will suit certain games or certain runs of games where you think actually they're going to be able to come in and provide a really it's, really specific role here it's the knowns and unknowns points and I'm, I'm with you entirely and I really want them to do two defenders but I almost want the two defenders to be and it doesn't have to be literally these footballers but to use two that we've been linked with I've not got much time for Mickey Longlegs and the reason why is he feels like a little bit of a halfway house. Are you house. selling Matic by the way? Uh, yes right. uh, um, my view is for instance if they do Pavard and Colwell you end up in a situation where you go and well, Colwell is a project and we can work on him for a period of time. Pavard, we know what he's about. Now we can argue about what we think he's about, but there's, it's unacceptable if Pavard signs for Liverpool, if Liverpool don't have a really strong sense of the football they're buying because there's an untold number of videos and background work that they can do in there. Colwell's a little bit different. It's a bit more of a point. And it might well be that Colwell is more expensive in a way, but I think, and again, to go back to types and what you want from a squad, I actually think... and. You know, this is a it's been a long winded way to sort of end up somewhere like this. But I actually think you almost want a bit of a mix of knowns and unknowns. You almost want a bit of like I refuse to believe Guardiola was absolutely on top of a precisely what he was getting out of a kanji, other than he's got the video and we're going to go from there. I think you almost want a bit of no. There's there's there's, there's some of these footballers are on a pathway to discovery mm. that we're all part of with them, and that that's not necessarily even in an age thing. That can be they haven't done that much at a certain level. And then there's other footballers where, no, we absolutely can have a reasonable expectation 
Pavard has got this many games playing for the best team in Germany. We know what he does when he plays for one of the best teams in the league. Just so to see what I mean. I think you need both. Yeah. Forget even the other, all the other way we talk about what you need. I think you want both, and I think this is a great summer for Liverpool to do that. Yeah, and I think on that point around, you know, sometimes, of course, these managers we're talking about, they are absolute geniuses, but there's no doubt they will stumble across things sometimes, and it just feels like it's... Maybe it's a little bit of genius, but also you've had a bit of a touch as well in I'm terms sure of Pep, luck. Pep would just force them to do what he wants them to do. Wouldn't <laughs> but you've had a, like, you've had a little bit with a big whip. Well, he doesn't nah. know exactly what Akanji's bringing because he's going <laughs> to plug him in and force him to do that. Thing. I, th- I think the extent to which Guardiola stumbles on loads of this really? this season and right. I, th- I think John's talked about it. It's on an in their shoes show next week. I think Guardiola's underratedness of a manager is a lot of the stuff that normal managers like Klopp or Ferguson who are brilliant managers get praised the skies for in the same way that I think for instance Klopp and Ferguson are underrated as tacticians and all this sort of stuff I think that Guardiola's underrated in terms of riding out momentum working out what works as he goes letting the players creating a culture all that sort of stuff that we they're they're all great managers Mm. and they're all great at all the things that means you've got to be a great manager Mm. and I think that because Guardiola's the mad professor of football and all this bollocks everyone underestimates his ability to go Probably go back into a training session and go, hang on, that worked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in a way yeah. that, look at a yeah. video and go, that worked. Yeah. In a way that it may well be... <laughs> but, but don't forget as well, that they are working with the best players. So oh, yeah, yeah. The best players are capable of taking on instruction and implementing it far more than, than, than players who are maybe playing for mid-table teams. It's obvious, isn't it? So, you know, it was interesting how we handled the Kyle Walker thing when he came out and said he's not capable of doing what I want him to do in terms of that inverted role, like a John Stones, for instance. I thought he handled that really poorly in terms of how it played out because I don't think Kyle Walker took it particularly well and why would you? Because he's just hung him out to dry. So it was a bit of a mad thing to do, but, you know... Um, if you want to call it, he's earned his lucky ass because, you know, he's, he's one of the best managers that's ever kind of, you know, managed the football team. So I think the unknowns bit is interesting. So that Colwell thing, I, I think he's, I think he's, I think he's great, but he only made 17 starts. So there's an, Ill, there's an unknown there. We, you don't quite know what you're going to get and there will be games where he gets exposed. Um, and you've seen Brighton drop him in and take him out. Obviously, he belongs, to, subs, he belongs to Chelsea. If he's got five subs, if he's got a top one, he's doing on 45. And if you want to talk about the manager and how he's maybe used those five subs, that's something that we've probably got to get better at because he has banged the drum for it and he's not the only one. But if you want to have five subs, then I think there's been times where maybe we could have used them slightly better uh, and slightly more often. But no, I'm not a huge fan of the five subs thing, if I'm, if I'm totally honest. But, you know, it, when it came in, I thought you'd see a lot more of Liverpool using it in a certain way, which hasn't really transpired. You come fifth, it goes a bit wrong. And no one in that dressing room, none of them, even the fellow who scores 30 goals or even the best goalkeeper in the world, can say, you know, ultimately things don't have to change. And for me, that's why this the knowns unknowns part and this idea of building a squad and this idea of... of the restart to me, Phil. That's why I think it is genuinely exciting. Not least because the footballers who remain uh, for the first day of pre-season or on the 31st of August, they've all got to be on board because they've got no argument. If they had some argument, Liverpool would have won more games of football. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. It feels like the start of a, the sort of must have started the second iteration of, of Klopp, really. We've had the first one, we've cleared out basically, I'd say everything that you could relate to say that didn't work really. I don't think there's anyone is there anyone left that you would say hasn't worked at any point in any way under Klopp. I don't think there is, is there? You, you only really think of Cater Chamberlain anyway, really, I suppose. You can but, have a bit of a chat about the two young attacking midfielders who I think have both played well, Elliot especially has played really well in some games, but worked what, again, what, again, what he's, do we 20, he's 20 no, I, mean, no, in, I just fine, mean in terms fine. of you brought them in with intentions and yeah. they've categorically proven that they were not uh, going to achieve the intentions that you brought if that makes sense um, whereas now it feels like he's got everyone that he wants that have learned what he's put N- within Nunes is the only one that query maybe Maybe, but it's, it's, a, it's a year. It a it's year. a year. So it is a year. But... And he had a similar first season at Benfica. You can sort of make. You can sort of make. No, you can sort of make. Not like Jake on that transfer committee that that we did when there was nearly a riot. But anyway, um, and a race, and a race. Yeah, that that was good too. Yeah, um, I just feel like there's a there's a working towards something position that we're in. We're in now. Okay, working towards something. Uh, more of that on the Anfield wrap across the next weeks and months uh, as we go through this transfer window. I reckon we're going to do it on this week. See you later.